And we're going to switch gears and I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Ashley Prosper. Uh, she did her medical school a few miles east of here at the University of Southern California, followed by residency and cardiac imaging uh, fellowship at uh, USC as well. And we are really happy that she chose UCLA uh, to join as, as faculty here and really it's a joy to work with her on a daily basis. She will be talking about the role of MRI and CT imaging. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I have to say it's really a privilege to be a cardiothoracic radiologist here at UCLA, um, to be able to work so closely with our adult congenital heart disease specialists. Uh, we get to collaborate a lot, and I think together we get to do some really great work. So no relevant financial disclosures. I do want to make it very clear that I am going to be discussing the off-label use of an agent called ferrumoxetol. All right, a common question that I'm faced with uh, when we image our adult congenital heart disease patients. Um, and that's MRI versus CT. So there are a couple of considerations that come into play for each individual patient. Of course, radiation, uh, the particular types of contrast that we're going to use, any artifact that we may be faced with, uh, availability and reproducibility of the images based on where the patient is coming from um, and which particular scanners are available to them and then which physiologic information we hope to obtain. So just something to be aware of and something that I get called about a lot when I'm in the reading room, um, both by physicians and by patients, is you know, radiation dose. And this is a fact that we really have to face. So you know, if you look at just the lay press, there are all sorts of articles that are talking about CT scans and radiation dose and should you be imaged or are you being harmed by getting these medical imaging uh, exams. And what I often do is I, you know, I tell patients about relative dose. Uh, so if we look at our CTA coronaries, for example, you're looking at about 12 millisieverts of dose. Well, if I said that to a patient, would they have any sort of idea of what a millisievert is? Likely not, unless they happen to be some sort of physicist or um, engineer, perhaps. But people do have an idea of background radiation dose that they may face just in their everyday life. So if you s instead say, well, that's about four years of background radiation dose that you would get just by living your life here in LA, well, that's a little bit of a better comparison for them. Now, of course, we're making technological improvements all of the time. Uh, CT has really come a long way so that we can modulate the amount of dose that patients receive, and we've really been able to cut down on the amount of radiation through a number of different advancements, including automated exposure control, our tube potential selection, uh, various gating methods. So this is really getting a lot better. Um, of course, MRI does not have any radiation involved, so that's, that's a plus there. Uh, the next is the type of contrast that we end up using. Um, now, we often refer to the American College of Radiology's contrast media manual. This is something that's publicly available. Um, one of the things that we always worry about are patients with renal impairment, okay? So if patients are on the borderline between normal renal function and needing dialysis, that's a tenuous line that, that we walk. Um, and then, of course, our patients on dialysis, we have to be particularly uh, cautious when we use gadolinium-based contrast for MRI in that particular setting. Gadolinium deposition. Now, I have this gif here of Chuck Norris. You may have seen him in the news with his wife talking about gadolinium deposition. And I tell you, once Chuck Norris got involved, I got a lot more phone calls. He was in Newsweek. He was everywhere. Um, now, he did raise an important point. There has been some scientific development in terms of gadolinium deposition. And this is something that we're mindful of, particularly in patients who are going to get serial imaging over the course of their life. Um, what we've learned as we've gone from the early years in 2014 to more recently in 2015 and 2016 is that our linear gadolinium agents, okay, are the ones that end up with potential for deposits in the brain. Conversely, our macrocyclic agents, which we are exclusively using here at UCLA, are much lower risk, okay? So we have transitioned from the use of linear gadolinium agents to macrocyclic agents, and this is much safer for our patients. Um, so, you know, basically that's our practical implication. 
Now, how do we really decide? You know, so these are some of the background considerations that we have. It's really a patient by patient basis. So I will sit down with Dr. Lynn, Dr. Lurie, um, Dr. Abelhosen, and we'll talk about what exactly we hope to gain from the imaging study. And then we decide whether or not to go for a CT or an MRI. So it's really the clinical question that needs to be answered, the patient's surgical history, what types of devices are in the chest, um, any sort of stents that might result in artifact how well the patient is able to tolerate a longer exam. Some of the MRIs can take a little bit longer than a CT, um, whether or not we're going to need anesthesia, and of course the patient's renal function. And I'm gonna give you a brief overview of some of the capabilities that we have in imaging. Uh, this is not by any means exhaustive, um, but we'll try to get through as much as we can here. So a big question is ventricular volume and function. Okay, so a really important thing is inter-observer reproducibility. So you want to make sure that if I calculate a volume and then my uh, colleague the next day um, calculates a volume, that you're going to get reproducible results. Now this has been shown to be very good with cardiac MRI. Um, there have been several inter-observer reproducibility studies, and they've shown that measurements in terms of mass and volume are reproducible with cardiac MRI using multi-planar imaging. Um, something that's becoming more important as well is not only the calculation of the volume and the mass of the primary ventricle, but also the secondary uh, ventricle, which may play a role in prognosis. So how do we do this? This is what it looks like. So this is uh, cardiac MRI, the larger image that you're going to see on the left side of the screen. It's a short axis image through uh, the left ventricle. You'll see that there's a green circle and there's a red circle. The green circle outlines the epicardial surface. The red circle outlines the endocardial surface. Now what we do, if you look at the images on the right, you'll see several slabs or slices through the heart and various projections. So I go through and I hand contour these circles through each slice of the heart. The, we then use the Simpsons method. Now this is honestly calculated by the computer. I'm not doing it in my head. But it takes the area of the slice for each width. Um, it multiplies it by the thickness of the slice and it adds all those volumes up and that's how we get our ventricular volume. So you can see it's particularly important uh, that whoever contours, contours in a similar way each time. What this looks like, uh, just to give you an idea, for example, if we're at the base of the heart, you draw a green line and a red a red line, you get your volume. You then go down to the next slice, you get another volume, you work your way down to the apex, you add all of these together. Now, function and volume can also be calculated by CT, provided you have good EKG gating um, and good signal capture. You can see moving images on CT, you can calculate volumes in a similar method using that Simpsons method to get volumes on CT. So that's something that we often do as well. Another important tool that we have is flow quantification. Now, this uh, image here, you'll see the aortic and the pulmonic valves, um, which are being imaged in a 2D plane. So this is a short axis image. You'll see flow is bright, so the white signal, uh, that's showing flow going forward. Um, what we do is we calculate the flow, the flow going forward as well as the flow going backwards so that we can calculate not only the total flow, uh, but any regurgitant fraction. Uh, another tool that we have available to us is 4D flow. So as opposed to the two-dimensional flow, which you saw in the last image, four-dimensional flow calculates flow in all directions. So what we can do, uh, you can see this image with all of the colorful uh, vectors. We can scroll through and choose any plane after the fact and calculate the flow going in any direction. Uh, now this is a more uh, labor-intensive and time-intensive uh, acquisition to acquire, but it's really useful, particularly when we have many different uh, flows that we want to quantify, whether that be uh, pulmonary venous, uh, aortic, the Fontan flow, any collateral flow. Uh, so this is a very useful tool for us. Um, now, how do we use uh, our flow measurements in the Fontan circulation? So, of course, you know, the obvious would be to calculate flow through the valves. Another uh, frequent question that we get is calculation of any collateral flow. Uh, so what we can do is look at the total pulmonary venous return, we can look at the pulmonary arterial flow, we can do some simple math, and we can calculate the aortopulmonary collateral burden. Um, and this is something that we're often asked to do. Um, oftentimes we have to look at areas of stenosis so we can calculate peak gradients um, at anything, any discrete area of stenosis. Um, we can also calculate valvar dysfunction. Circuit patency. 
Uh, so one of the things I'm often asked to do is to look at um, our Fontan shunts uh, to see if they're patent, if there's any thrombus, as Dr. Abelhosen showed us earlier, um, if there's any stenosis in any of the areas. Now, how do we do that? If it's a matter of CT, we're going to need multi-phase imaging. So you can see the image on the left, this is an arterial phase image. So you can see that the left ventricle, the aorta, are brightly illuminated here. But the Fontan, we can't really tell what's going on. So if you saw that one image in an isolation, you might think, oh boy, is that a huge clot? Is it entirely thrombose? And I have had uh, referrals from outside um, institutions where that has been a question. We've then done multi-phase imaging. You can see uh, the image over there on the right. This is a delayed phase, and you can see that everything is faintly but homogeneously opacified, and that lets us know that that circuit is actually open. So if it's going to be CT, that means a little bit additional radiation because we need a couple of phases to determine that everything is patent. Uh, here's another example. This is a cross-sectional image looking at the level of the left coronary artery at the Fontan, the main pulmonary artery, and the right PA. You'll see that on the left, the image is very confusing. Uh, you would be very concerned that perhaps you have a huge thrombus there. If you wait uh, about a minute or so and do a second pass, you can see that everything is homogeneously opacified. Everything is widely patent. So multi-phase imaging is particularly uh, helpful here. Uh, we can also do multi-phase imaging uh, with MRI. So if you see the image on the left here, uh, this is a time-resolved image angiogram, and we can see everything opacify. Additionally, we can take still images at multiple phases. The arterial phase image is uh, in the center there. On the right, we have our venous phase image where everything is opacified. Um, an additional tool that we have, and again, this is an off-label um, use is something called ferrimoxitol. It's an iron nanoparticle, which was uh, actually FDA approved for the treatment of anemia in patients with end-stage renal disease. Uh, we found that it's an excellent imaging agent. It produces T1 shortening and produces beautiful vascular imaging. Um, on the left, you can see a steady state MRA ferroheme, so you'll see that the arteries and the veins are equally um, bright and intense. Um, on the right, um, but we can also get uh, cinematic images and look at function. So we've often transitioned to this for many of our adult congenital heart disease patients. Now in this patient, um, in the same exam, we were able to do multi-station imaging through the chest, the abdomen, and the pelvis. And this patient, uh, as you can see indicated by the arrows here, there's a large void of signal uh, in the right uh, pelvic venous system. So this patient had a large clot burden in the abdomen and pelvis. So we were, not able, we were able to not only image all of the chest vasculature, but also find that clot as well. So steady state imaging is particularly useful for us. Again, uh, ferrimoxitol, iron nanoparticle, um, it's used off-label for MRI. Uh, it's administered at a dose of four milligrams per kilogram up to a total dose of 510 milligrams. What's really great about it is it stays bright in the system for about 24 to 48 hours. So we can do delayed imaging at any time that we like. It's ultimately taken up by the mononuclear phagocyte system and used to make blood. Um, what you'll see coming out in publication soon from UCLA uh, is the results of a 10 uh, center registry um, looking at the safety and the efficacy of fair human imaging. So look for that. All right, coronary artery evaluation, and we're going to try to keep this brief <laughs> because we're running out of time. Um, MRI can successfully image the proximal segments of the coronary arteries, but CT really still excels in terms of our um, detailed imaging of the full extent of the coronary arteries. Regardless of the modality that we have at hand, we're looking for anomalous origins, stenoses, aneurysms, fistulas, and the proximity to any uh, stents uh, pre-procedural for planning. Just an example here of a high-resolution CT looking at the coronary arteries. You might see that uh, the coronary arteries are taking some unusual turns and fistulizing with the ventricles. Um, these are of particular interest to me. Uh, fibrosis in the Fontan patient. Um, as our patients age, uh, we look for areas of scarring as well. Now, this is something that we really need gadolinium for in the MRI magnet. Um, we're looking at areas of delayed enhancement. So you'll see 
And the image on the left is a short axis through the functional images of the heart. The image on the right is a post-contrast delayed image. Everything that's bright there, uh, which is actually in the inferior septum, is scar. Future directions for fibrosis. Some of the things that will be moving more from a research spectrum into a clinical spectrum are T1 mapping and extracellular volume calculation, which we can do uh, with MRI. So in conclusion, um, we've looked at a lot of images from both MRI and CT. They're both incredibly powerful tools. I'd say the most important thing is to sit down with your radiologist and talk about what it is that you want to see to come up uh, with a cohesive plan together before the patient is imaged. Um, and that allows us to really um, find the areas of greatest interest. Um, optimal bolus timing is crucing, crucial in the evaluation of the Fontan patient. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and appreciate your time.